So we're in the bracha of Slach Lono, of Inu Kichotono. We're asking God to forgive us for the past. Slach Lono, of Inu Kichotono. Forgive us, our Father, that we've sinned. And as we explained last time, we discussed this bracha. Chotono is when one sins inadvertently, either as a result of lack of knowledge, lack of cognizance, what is not aware or fully appreciative of what he's doing wrong. But if he would, he wouldn't do the wrong thing. So they've, as a result of that, a transgression, which is, which is violated in a context of lack of knowledge or unawareness, it's not a breach, it's not a disrespect to God, although outwardly, You've crossed lines, but since it was done unintentionally, the relationship is still father-son. Therefore, we refer to Hashem as a vino in this particular moment. In this context of inadvertency, the relationship is a child asking the father for forgiveness. Because we never meant to breach the relationship to any degree. But nevertheless, what do you need forgiveness? So we explain based on the Ramak or Moshkur de Viro. Nevertheless, if a person ingests something which is lethal or deadly, regardless of what, whatever your intent was, it may have been due to an oversight or not being aware of the detriment of ingesting that, but factually, you've ingested something which compromises whether it's your physicality or your spiritual system. So we ask God, even in the context of inadvertency, should forgive us, it means he should rehabilitate, he should neutralize the negative effect and rehabilitate the negative to restore it to what it was originally. That's what we're asking God. So it's not like two people have some disagreement and one offends the other and yes for forgiveness. There it's purely... There's no negative consequence other than the person's feelings being hurt. So if he forgives you, therefore it's restored. He, there's no claim against you because he forgave you. But when a person sins, the reason why, and this is very important, at Sinai, the Jews were given a whole different level of responsibility versus their lives. We live within the context of 613 mitzvos, 365 positive, Negative, 248, positive. Why? But the Gentile, the non-Jew, seven Noahide laws are sufficient. The answer is that since our spiritual system, our souls, have a totally different composition spiritually, only God knows what that makeup is. Therefore, understanding what would be a de detriment to this sophistic sophisticated soul we have 365 areas of negativity, which are negative commandments, that if we cross any of those lines, our souls are compromised. And God wants them to be intact. So therefore, he's decreed negative commandments. You can't cross those lines. Because ultimately, it's going to affect your spirituality. The non-Jew who doesn't have that same infrastructure of spirituality ingesting non-kosher, violating days of sanctity, has no relevance to him. Or sexual relationships, which are not permitted to the Jew, which are permitted to them. All these areas, because in terms of their spiritual makeup, it has no consequence whatsoever. It doesn't enhance it, but it does has no consequence. For a Jew, it has a very serious consequence. Because factually, being touched by that, or ingesting that, crossing those lines, compromise who we are spiritually. Therefore, even on an inadvertent level, we ask God as our father, because the it was not intentional. It was then meant, it's not a disrespect, but it's a fact. And therefore we need that neutralization. We need his infusion of whatever that is to rehabilitate our spirituality. Just to give you an example. I mean, Moshe Rabbeinu at the burning bush there's a dialogue between God and Moshe for seven days. God says to, to Moshe, I want you to go to Egypt to be my redeemer and redeem the Jewish people, to take them out of Egypt and ultimately take them to Sinai to become God's people. 
Moshe initially resisted and he asks many questions. And there's a dialogue that goes on between the two of them for seven days. Why Moshe feels he's not qualified to be the redeemer. But Chazal tell us, Midrash tells us, what was really driving him to not want to assume this responsibility? Because he had an older brother, Aaron, who was a prophet, who was special. And he felt that by him assuming the position of redeemer, it actually, his brother's feelings would be hurt. So he tried in the worst way to extricate himself for whatever reason, not to be the redeemer. So as a result of him not being available, God would choose our own, his brother, his old elder brother, to be the redeemer. And God, for seven days, they go back and forth. Every reason why Moshe claims he's not qualified, Moshe, God responded. And finally, after all the questions were answered, and all the reasons why he wasn't qualified, he says to Hashem, but why don't you send the person who normally represents you to be, to be the redeemer? God says, you've gone beyond the pale. Humility is up to a point. You're ready treading on area, which is considered disrespect. If you have a, le a legitimate question, a slightly legitimate question, you have a right to ask it for clarification. But after I've answered all the questions, and now you feel that you should still not be, although you're doing it due to your humility, but it's unacceptable, it's a disrespect. And because of that level of disrespect, until you, now you were meant to be the Kohen, but now your brother, the Levi, Aaron, will be the Kohen and you will not be the Kohen. As a result of that, you forfeited the priesthood forever for you and your children. Aaron and his progeny will be the Kohanim. Moshe Rabbeinu never intended to act disrespectful to any degree. It was all driven by his humility. So it was really inadvertent. It doesn't make a difference. But if in fact you crossed the line that you shouldn't have crossed and it was considered a disrespect to God, there's a consequence. Now, as a result of that, what happens? Moshe has to install and we're going to read about this, Aaron and his children, to be the Kohanim. Not only does he have to install them, he has to anoint them. He dresses them in their priestly vestments. And he does, has to do it with joy. The question is, if you, God already clipped his wings, as they say. He forfeited the priesthood. And there's no question he did tshuva. He repented. Why, is, why did he have to himself be the one to anoint them, to dress them, and to literally walk them into the position. Why? The answer is, the Orachayim HaKadosh explains, based on the Zohar, that when a person sins, there's a certain detachment from God. There's a distance. He compares it, if you have a branch, which is nearly severed from the trunk of a tree. If that is the case, there's very little nourishment going from the trunk into the branch. The more you secure that branch to the source of nourishment, that branch will function at a more healthy level. But Moshe Rabbeinu, and it's the same thing with a person since, you've created a distance between yourself and the source of everything which is God himself. Because the ultimate objective is to do something on a qualitative level, to be as secure as you can to that source, which is God himself, to cleave to that. But if you sin, the sin causes a distance. It's a level of detachment. Moshe Rabbeinu, although he forfeited the priesthood, although he did tshuva, although he understood our own is going to be, and his children are going to be the Quran forever, and he's forfeited forever. Nevertheless, to be fully reinstated and attached to the source, he personally has to take our own and his children, anoint them, spiritualize them. It's like, you know, it's bad enough I forfeit it. It's like putting salt on the wounds. It's painful enough I no longer have no. So Rechaim HaKodesh says, he quotes the Talmud, the Gemara in Brochus, just, just as a Jew, 
has to say a blessing. When good fortune comes to him, Keshem Shevorchan Latov, we say Shechionu. When good fortune comes to us, identically, Bevorchan Avara. We acknowledge God when God from a tragedy comes. What's the blessing we say? We say Dayanayimus. God is the true judge. We may not understand, but conceptually speaking, there is no question this is in our best interest, although we can't process it. Why it is, but factually we accept that as it is. Identically, and it says, as you say the blessing for good fortune, which you definitely say with joy, a person has to reach a level to fully internalize the value that it's joyous, it's, it's an opportunity that he's able to actually experience the pain because the pain is the basis for the rehabilitation. And I always give the example, a person has, God forbid, a cancerous tumor. And the surgeon says that if we excise the tumor at this point, you won't need even any chemotherapy. You need nothing because we're going to remove it at a time before it compromised the system. It's not in the system. There's not even a microscopic cell within it. And everything is healthy and intact, but it has to be excised. The recovery is going to be painful. You're going to be incapacitated for a period of time, but ultimately you're going to recover and you're going to add 50 years to your life. Although the person is pain during the recovery period, but he knows this is his new, this is new lease to life. So he's ecstatic. And it's the doctor. It takes years to get an appointment with this person. And if he wouldn't get the appointment immediately, he's not going to survive his illness until the surgery is going to be taking, taking place. He literally leaves no stone, stone unturned to be able to have this surgery done. But it's painful. It's costly. But at all costs, a person is willing to go through it to save his life. So if you, if you understand that the value of your life is eternity, to be part of eternity, to have a relation with God, and something tragic happens, and nothing happens, happenstance, coincidence, it's not random, but it's specific, to the degree that it happens, it's because God wanted it to happen to that degree. It's only in your best interest. And the value of that is a full reinstatement. And especially if you process it properly and embrace it and have that level of belief, then definitely it brings the person back to where he should be. And therefore it's the ultimate opportunity and benefit. Moshe was inadvertent. He did it do only to his humility. It doesn't make a difference. A disrespect is a disrespect. Regardless, though, that it's a tribute to humility, it had nothing to do with his ego, but still unacceptable. So it's still Avinu. The relationship between God and Moshe is Avinu. Moshe was the most beloved son of God. It doesn't make a difference. It had to be done because that was in his best interest. To restore and to reattach him that ultimately he should cleave at the most advanced level, he had to go through the various processes until he was back where he should be and even beyond. Therefore, even on an invert level, where the relationship is father-child, we still ask for forgiveness, because forgiveness, again, is that level of rehabilitation to be worthy to restore the relationship where it was and where it should be. I'll give you an example. You know, we find that the patriarchs and matriarchs, they were all barren. Avram was barren, Saru was barren, Yitzhak and Rivka were barren. He first fathered a child at the age of, he was 60. 20, they were married 20 years before Rivka gave birth to her children. Leah was barren, Rachel was barren. Why? I mean, here we have the most special human beings who ever walked the face of the earth. Any other person conceives quickly, naturally, without any degree of problem. Here, they had to turn over worlds for them to merit and miracles that they should be able to conceive. Why? Why is that the case? So the Midrash tells us, God desires 
the tefillah, the prayer, the supplication of tzaddikim. Because they were the most special people who ever walked the face of the earth. God says, I want to hear from you. I want to see you. I want you to be dedicated to me. I want you to express that dedication. Person where everything's in place, you pray, you believe. It's not with the same level of intensity. Every person has the ability to upgrade and to advance to a greater degree. As I always say to all of us, every one of us, as well as we're doing, we all know we can do slightly better. And that's an understatement. We can do a lot more than slightly better. But if God forbid, if we would have a problem, we not only do, do we know we can do better, we would do better. Because believing that the only way that problem could go away, maybe, is only by upgrading, we're going to upgrade. So you see, the circumstance puts us, brings a certain degree of clarity to be able to understand the value of what needs to upgrade, to do more. Does it really make a difference if I study another five, day, five minutes a day? But we say, you know something, if Talmud Torah connected Kulam, if the mitzvah of study of Torah is the equivalent of all the mitzvahs combined, and according to the Vilna Gon, every word of Torah that you study is the equivalent of all 613 mitzvahs, so what is the value of five minutes? It has infinite value. But we don't see it that way. We've studied two hours. We've studied so much. A little more won't make a difference. But yet, when we have a problem, all of a sudden, the five minutes take on a new level of value. Of course, maybe those five minutes will make the difference. I'll give you an example. There's a deal. You're able to buy a billion-dollar property for $100,000, but you only have $99,999, a short $1. And unless you put down 100000 cash, the deal, you lose the deal. But you're able to get a billion-dollar piece of property for 100000 there's no stone you're not going to overturn to get that extra dollar to bring it to $100,000. Because understanding at that moment the value of a dollar, that's the value. That dollar is going to make a difference whether you get the deal or you don't. Those five minutes being in a situation of worry and concern, all of a sudden those five minutes take on a new degree of, of value, understanding. You're going to upgrade. But yet we don't. Unless, God forbid, we have the problem. If we have the problem, do we upgrade enough? But that's all inverted. That that we don't invest our time and our minds, our energies, and our emotion to a greater degree, it's only because we underestimate and we have all these blind spots and these distractions, and therefore we don't fully internalize and understand the full value of what's available to us. That's all chatonu. That's inadvertent. We want to be good Jews. We are good Jews, but still, we can still be better. That's Chotonu. It's still father-son relationship. It's Chotonu. It is inadvertent. But we still have to ask God to forgive us because fa- if we fail on our own watch where we should be more responsible, there is a consequence to that. Therefore, we need forgiveness. We need rehabilitation, as I explained. Otherwise, as we say, mitzvah is mitzvah. When we do a mitzvah, that creates an energy to do more when we fall short of our responsibility, which there's a claim against us, that actually engenders more, more reason to fail to a greater degree. As we said many times, it's, it's a slippery slope. When you're in that slope, unless you're really ascending it at a pace, just gravity is going to pull you down. And if there's inertia naturally, what happens and when you're on that steep incline? Unless you grapple up and you have something really catapulting you up that mountain, you're going down the mountain. That's reality. And that's all part of what? That's chotonu. That's inadvertent. We're not even aware. Forgive us, Father, that we sin inadvertently to you. It wasn't deliberate. It could be a lack of knowledge, lack of cognizance, a lack of focus. We're distracted. We rationalize. We justify. Therefore, it's permitted, but it's not permitted. So we're asking God forgiveness, even in that context, because of the consequence and the liability and the fact of what reality we experienced. If a person, the only location he has to live is in a, in a coal mine, and for years he breathes coal dust, he had no choice. But what reality is he gets black lung. And eventually, God forbid, he it's going to compromise his health, he may die from it. It's just a circumstance. 
So you pray to God in that situation, despite the physical condition, allow me to live and make the best of it, despite my health being compromised due to my circumstance. Same thing, you're compromised. It's not my choice. It's just the reality. You live within the in, in, in the, the um, Chernobyl reactor. They had the, you couldn't drink the milk. It was because of the radiation. Children came down with cancer. Every, they were victims. It doesn't make a difference. You still pray that whatever, whatever way, degree you're affected, you should be less affected or, or else be, being taken out of there. Not to be exposed any longer. But that's slach lon vinki chotonu. was never intentional, but, but it's just a fact of life. It's just living. We trip, we fall. Person gets a scrape, he falls. You want it to heal. It's not your fault that you fell. Maybe if you would have been more cognizant, you wouldn't have fall. It doesn't make a difference. So in the, in the spiritual, it's slach lon vinu ki chotonu. Forgive us, Father, that we failed, we transgressed inadvertently. Forgive us, our king, that we sinned, transgressed deliberately, deliberately. If you know God says you're not permitted to do it, and you understand who God is and who you are, how do you cross that line? If you have any love for your father or any respect for your father, it's not acceptable. It's unjustified. Somehow we delude ourselves and we justify it. But that that you're able to delude, delude yourself and justify it, that's, that's a disrespect. That disrespect automatically compromises the relationship between father and son. Now, why we bound to the will of God? Because we, is, we are the subjects and he is the king. So now recognizing that because of our inclinations and our skeletons in our closets and our handicaps, naturally born handicaps, due to the tree of knowledge that Adam in ingested a certain substance called evil, which causes us to gravitate, draws us to that. But still, God says you have, you have control. You have control. And if you have control and you chose not to control and you acted proactively aware of what you did, that's a breach. That means you're the priority. God's not the priority any longer. You failed as a subject of the king. So we're going, speaking to God, that although we breach the relationship of father-son, but as the master, as the king, we're coming and pleading for forgiveness. Poshano, Poshano could either mean one or two things, either deliberate or defiant. The Talmud explains what's the difference between a deliberate violation and a defined violation. A person has is a glutton, enjoys more than enjoys good food, but he has control. And the only meat which is available is the steak, because there's only one steakhouse in, in the city called Ponderosa Steakhouse. And the meat is grade A, kosher, kosher species, but the meat is not kosher. And he walks by that steakhouse and he can visualize the sizzling meat on that grill and he can't control himself. He knows he shouldn't go in there. But yet he succumbs to his desire. Just this one time goes through the door. And as it gets closer, he makes the, he makes the decision just this one time. So what are you saying? God, at this moment, I'm, I have priority. You'll forgive me. Whatever way he, he justifies it in his mind, it's not a justification. It minimizes the wrong in his mind, therefore allows him to cross that line. That's called deliberate, but it's not defiant. Because if he do have the equivalent in kosher, he would not eat non kosher. That's called leteovon. It's due to your desire, you cross the line. What is a defiant Jew, which is very much more serious? You have two steakhouses. They're both written up in the guide, in the restaurant guide, five star. The chef in the kosher restaurant is even a better chef than the one non-kosher restaurant. 
But because God says, I have to eat kosher, and the price is the same, kosher is not more expensive than non-kosher. And because they're celebrating their 60th anniversary, they're giving a discount on the kosher meat. And even the most kosher, the non-kosher, it's more expensive, the kosher restaurant, the non-kosher. You choose to go to non-kosher because God says, eat kosher, you say, I will eat non-kosher. That's called defiance. That's the ultimate level of sin. That's the most extreme level of sin. The word pesha includes that. So we say, forgive us our king. We deliberately cross that line. Deliberately can mean due to desire or due to defiance. Even within that context, God is willing to forgive. As, as long as you're sincere regarding your remorse, and you truly want to turn over a new leaf and do things right going forward, God as king will pardon you, will forgive you. But we speak, it's not only pardoning, we're talking about rehabilitation. He will give you every opportunity to be able to recover because now you're going to behave like a proper subject to adhere to the, what? To the dictate of the king. But why are we going to God? Could you imagine? A person has a father who loves him. You have a king who loves you, and he sees you sincere. And you did certain things, which literally, which you put your life in jeopardy. The king himself, the father himself, can't help you. The child ingests the poison. As much as the father loves the child, he can't help the child. The child is actually, is, is waning. Is, 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 his life is, is ebbing, ebbing out of him. The king... It's such a negative transgression, even the king is not able to pardon you. It, that, that's how terrible and extreme the defiance was. It, was. it was espionage, whatever it was. And according to, never was anybody ever pardoned on this level. You went and betrayed your country. So what are you going to the king? You could plead your case from now forever. It's not reality. When we go to Hashem, regardless of how severe that transgression was, whether it was inadvertent, whether it was deliberate, whether it was defiant, regardless of the consequence of that, to what degree our spirituality was compromised, why are we going to God to do all this? So we conclude, Ki mochel because you are a king and a father who's mochel. You forgive. So leach. It's interesting. When we made the request, we first started with slicha, as a child to a father. When we speak to the king, it's called mechila. It's a much more serious level of rehabilitation because we know you are mochel. You are, per, you are a being who rehabilitates even on the most extreme level of transgression. So if even on the most extreme level of transgression, you rehabilitate us, the solechoto. So definitely at the lesser level, where it's on the inverted level. So because it's within your power, and not only within you, and you do, therefore we're coming to you, supplicating you, humbling ourselves before you, because we recognize the wrong we did, that you should bring about that level of forgiveness at whatever level that transgression took, took place. That's what we're asking God. Now, for God to do this, we speak about what's the difference between, we say a person is gracious. He's a, gr a gracious host. You have a good host, an exceptional host, and gracious host. The word gracious has a whole different level of connotation. It's done with graciousness. That even after, graciousness means that you know, very often you have a gracious host. person is, a, is, is, is hosted specially. person almost feels embarrassed. Who am I? What am I? Royalty. But the host will make the, the guest feel as if the guest is doing the host a favor. That's true graciousness. I bought this for you because, you know, so it's my honor you should be here. When you eat of my food, I feel validated. I feel you've given me value. Because that's my purpose. My value is to be help other people, value other people. So don't think you're the beneficiary, I am the beneficiary. That's a gracious toast. Ki mochel v'soleachoto, baruchat to Hashem. Again, baruchat to Hashem means 
Everything emanates from you. All blessing emanates from you. And what emanates from you? Hanun. You are gracious. Gracious goes beyond merciful. The mercy is with graciousness. Hamar loach. With abundance, you forgive. You know, sometimes, you know, you have, you go to the store and they have certain cleansers. And they say, this cleanser kills 89% of the germs, viruses. They come out with a new one, 99.9, including this other kind of virus. So even though visually speaking, the surface seems to be clean and it, it sparkles, immaculate, but there, there are certain viruses or bacteria on that location. You know, it's, it was written up a few years ago that when you travel on a plane, the tray that's before you, the level of bacteria that's on that tray, it's not to be believed. People's desks in their office, the level of bacteria that's on that desktop, it's not to be imagined. So today we have wipes, all kinds of wipes to clean it. What do you mean? It, it sparkles. It was you use pledge uh, dust dust. You know, yeah, put on your sunglasses because the light of the office reflects off that desk. That's how it shines. Doesn't mean to say the bacteria is not there. After a person sins, to have a full recovery, fully rehabilitated, it's not simple. It's miraculous. It's Hanun. You are gracious that regardless of whatever level we fail, even defiantly, deliberately defiantly, or it may be an oversight, but you should have been more cognizant. Hanun, with gracious habardelis loach, with abundance you forgive us. It's not he takes us nine yards. He takes us all the way back to home plate to literally reinstate us that was secure where we should have been initially, as if we never left. That's Hanun. It doesn't say Hanun Lisloach. You're gracious to forgive. Hanun Hamarbeh. With abundance, you forgive. What is what is what is that uh, the connotation with abundance? As I just explained, there's not even a microscopic spiritual cell of the past transgression. That's Hamar bed. That's what you need. That's one understanding. I'm thinking something else. We say that mitzvah is mitzvah. We do a mitzvah, it creates an energy, a positive energy, which allows you to do more mitzvah. Let's say a person repents, does tshuva, and you're worthy of forgiveness. You would say maybe that since the basis for this mitzvah was due to your transgression, Maybe this should not engender an energy should bring you to other mitzvahs. He's so gracious with forgiveness. It's done with abundance. As a result of that, this tshuva will bring you to do other good things. That is like an overflow. A marba means, you know, person, I have a quart vessel and I ask you to put something in and you want to put so much in, it overflows. My cup overflows. That's the level of blessing over here. Even though the basis for the forgiveness is that you cross the line. So I should forgive you, leave it at that. But there should be a positive aspect to it beyond forgiveness, beyond reinstatement, that it should actually engender to do other good things. You know, person goes and steals and he re returns what he steals and he has forgiveness. The Victim who was victimized, he says, you know, because you return it, you know something? I'm going to give you a bonus. Give you a bonus. You know, what a bonus. You shouldn't have stolen. Thank God you came to a level of clarity that you return what you stole. On top of that, I should give you a bonus to be able to what? To invest in future opportunities to make more money. I have no interest in you. No. God is so gracious that he's marbeh. Not only does he allow you to recover in this context, even cr creates a value that takes you others. There's a story, and there's a, a story I'm not going to divulge the names of the person. 
there was a certain person who worked for somebody many years ago, not to be believed. And the person was a gambler, addicted. And he was embezzling money from this company. And the accountant, who was very good, his accountant says, something not, not right here. Somebody is, is siphoning off money. And they launched an investigation. They found that it was this person. And they found out he was, a, he, was a, he was a gambler. He had an addiction to gambling. So what would you do? What would I do? Even though you may not prosecute the person and press charges, because it's, it's pitiful, he has a, an issue, but you would terminate him, say, look, you have a problem, unfortunately, go your way. Cut your losses, let the, guy go, let the person go. This employer went and paid for his rehabilitation to rehabilitate him that he should no longer be a, a, a gambler. Could you, it's not to be believed. He actually went and un, got the best person, had it researched by some others, that this person, he should be able to recover from his gambling addiction. And I'm not sure if he, re, if he rehired him or not. I think he even rehired him. But he was, of course, he was watched. After you go and bezel, and after you, that kind of person, I should worry about you. You know, you cut your losses and cut them loose, let them go. It's unheard of. This is gracious. And you have to be a gracious person to do this. Forgive, not only forgive, address his issue. Addre even after you address his issue, you give him opportunity that he should be able to earn a living. It's unheard of. I'm going to divulge the person's name. His name is Ira Rannett. He's the one. That was the employer and there was an employee. It's not to be believed. But you know, when, when we do such things, everything is measure for measure. God says, the way you behave, that's the way I interact with you. Because everything that goes around comes around. And that's Mahu Afato. As he is that, we should emulate him. And definitely God, we fail on, the, on his watch. Endlessly. We misappropriate the blessing he gives us. But he still gives us blessing. So be able to put it in that context and behave even in this context, which is almost not to be believed. Hashem says, you know something, you're reflecting my attribute of graciousness. So when Hashem goes and forgives, it's not only he forgives, not only does he rehabil rehabilitate it, it's with graciousness and with abundance that it's not only that, I'll do whatever I can to help you from now on. I'm not saying to go to that degree and employ him, but if you could, you would help the person. You know, it was known in Europe. You know, we think Europe that so many yeshiva students, there weren't that many. Even when we talk about the most, the greatest Torah academies, which produced the greatest Torah sages. If they had, we're talking about, there were a few million Jews in Europe, two million Jews, whatever, it's two and a half million Jews in Europe. Or they were, before the war, we were talking about the six million victims. That's what they were. But how many students do you think were in the yeshivas? All combined, if you had 5,000 students, you had a lot. A lot of students. If a student would not make the grade in the yeshiva, you know what they would do? He'd have to leave because it wasn't good for him or for the, the, his fellow, his peers, that he should be there. But what would they do? They would look and find another yeshiva for him that would, would accommodate him despite whatever he didn't live up to the grade. And they would write a letter of endorsement to that other yeshiva and they would give him even car fare to be able to travel to that other location. It's not once you're put out, we throw you to the dogs. It's not a responsibility any longer. Every person has a responsibility to every Jew. So although you don't make the grade here, I'll do whatever I can to address your need somewhere else. A Jew doesn't abandon a Jew. God doesn't abandon Jews. We don't abandon Jews. Unless a person is truly continues in his evil, defiant ways. That's something else. But if a person shows any level of remorse, he wants to come back to be rehabilitated, we embrace him. And that's what God wants. Just as I said, just as a, a parent to a child, 
if the ch- parent sees any indication, the child wants to make amends and correct his, his errant ways, the child's, the parent's waiting for that moment. So we, be, we, we have to behave. So Chanun, he's gracious, with abundance, he forgives. Just a reflection of this. We said, in the second blessing, with abundant mercy. When you come to this world initially, there's, there's the attribute of mercy. Because without mercy, you couldn't survive. But once you've lived your life in this world, and it's a question of coming back, resurrection, you need more than rachmim. You need more than mercy. Mechaim eisim berachmim rabim. Need ab- abundant mercy. Without abundant mercy, nobody, very few people will make the grade to be able to be resurrected and to be part of that eternal existence, which is the ultimate intent. When a person f- sins, you know, he may recover 80%, 90%. But to fully be rehabilitated, firstly, God does it with graciousness. And not that it's with graciousness, it's with abundance. As I said, it's only with abundant mercy, the resurrection. Ordinary standard of mercy is not going to be sufficient. For forgiveness, we have to understand. So let's understand something. A person did something unconscionable to someone else and he forgave him and he showed through his interaction with him that he's treating him as if he never did the wrong thing. What should be that person's sense of beholdenness to the person who originally he had offended or he had violated, or victimized? He owes him his life. He should be so thankful. We all know we're, we're far from perfect. Comes to Yom Kippur. And if a person utilizes the day properly, and we do tshuva, we repent, and we appreciate what God offered us. And by the end of the day, we feel we unloaded endless debt. And it was only due to God's mercy. And there's no more merciful day than Yom Kippur. What level of beholdenness, thankfulness, appreciation should we have for God going forward? Are we going to cross those lines again? If we truly understand what we were relieved of, how do you go right back into the feedback? How do you go back right into that pigsty and create that squalor again? If you understand what God just did for you, that that he forgave you was with graciousness. That he forgave you was with abundance. It's unheard of. He treats you like a prince. And after he puts you back in the pedestal as a prince, you behave like a villain. It's unconscionable. The answer is, you know why? Because we don't think about it. If a person would focus and understand what it means to transgress, what it means to sin, and what it means to be reinstated, and you have that mindset initially, and you want to be reinstated, you want to have a relationship, wouldn't you think every precaution that you shouldn't go back to where you were originally because you appreciate and understand what was done for you? And if you would... Of course, we're not perfect. We're far from perfect. But at a certain level, you, you'll take full control over your life due to understanding what was, what was offered and what was done for you on your behalf. But you want to know something? It's not so simple. Why? You have a person, God forbid, is a drug addict. Before he starts craving for that foreign substance, he's read all the information. He even lectures on it. And he... Puts it across like nobody can put it across with a level of absolute clarity. And the audiences are touched and appreciate what he's saying. But when that lecturer starts craving for that foreign substance, it's as if he never read that literature, never lectured on it, and he's right back where he was. Of course, the craving is so overwhelming. And almost he's at a point he can't control himself. Every human being has that microscopic cell, which is called evil. And when that evil rears its head, you need tremendous strength. But what about be thankful? 
the drug addict, alcoholic, what do you have to do? You have to keep the drugs away from him and you have to keep the alcohol away from the, from the, from the alcoholic. That's the only way he could. Because the moment he gets too close, he starts craving. And when, as the craving starts, it intensifies. And it reaches a certain level, he's out the door. And that's the way it is. So what did Chazal tell us? What did rabbis teach us? In Pirkei Avos, right at the beginning. We have to make fences. Without fences, you cannot survive. You cannot survive it. Because every one of us is addicted at a certain level. And if we're exposed to certain things which we have, which we're vulnerable in those areas, it's like a magnetism. You're drawn there. So a person who's appreciative and understands we have to make fences. You know, they say, you know, fences make, make good neighbors. Right? Fences make good Jews. Fences make good subjects. There's a beautiful word from the Rechaim HaKadosh. We find that the Jews were off in the Torah and they said, what? Nasev Nishma. We accept it unequivocally. And all of a sudden, Torah tells us, God puts the mountain over our heads and says, either you accept or you can be buried under the mountain. How do we understand it? And the Midrash asked the question. If we already said, we wholeheartedly embrace it, unequivocally, you put a gun to my temple and say, you better do it or else. That's the mountain overheads. So Rechaim HaKadosh explains it this way. The Jews accepted the Torah in its entirety, both the written and oral law. However, God says, it's not enough. I'm empowering the rabbis to legislate fences and you're bound to those fences. So the Jews said, there's no limit. They could start legislating fences. They're going to put us into, into a straitjacket. We're not going to be able to move an inch in any, in any direction. God says, firstly, they won't do that. You may see it as that, that the levels of restriction rabbinical are to that degree, but without fences, you cannot survive. You cannot survive. It's like the drug counselor tells the people, if you want to take, keep control of your life, you have to create certain barriers. And if you don't have the barriers, no chance you're going to survive. And God said, I understand the reality. I'm putting them out over your heads. If not, creation goes back to pre-creation. Because otherwise, you definitely will fail. You cannot survive as a Jew, as a spiritual being, unless you accept the fences that the rabbis legislate. And they accept it. It's the exact same thing. Even though we understand with, with enormous graciousness and kindness, God forgives us, rehabilitates us. So how could we be so unappreciative and betray God again? The answer is, it's like the addict. We have to appreciate, we have to make take certain, we have to create precautions. Person desires, a person that is on, has to maintain his weight. And it could be detriment to his health. Doctor says, or the nutrition says, you know something? Never go shopping when you're hungry. Only after you've eaten, you're satisfied. So therefore, you're not going to buy anything you shouldn't buy. Don't bring into your house anything unless it's a necessity. After you shop, fully save it. And that's how you create fences. And if somebody wants to give you a gift of something, don't accept it. Person alcoholic, somebody wants to give them a gift, not, not knowing it, a bottle of, of, of whiskey. I don't care what the quality of the whiskey is. And it brings back memories. The man is dreaming of tasting that quality of whiskey, which he never tasted before. Can't accept it. Sorry, thank you, but no thank you. Because the moment you taste it, or you take it in the house, you're already in a position that it, you're, uh, it's uncontrollable. You've lost control over your life. So if a person doesn't make defense, it's not an indication he's an ingrate. He's not an ingrate. Because that's the reality of who we are. But factually, we have to know, at least intellectually speaking, what was needed to bring you back. What did God have to do? God turned over worlds. God created 
remedies which are which were never which are unheard of. For you, understanding his concern and love for you that he allowed this to happen with graciousness. For that reason, you should make every effort to make offense, to be able to control it. That's how you're expressing your gratefulness and your boldness to God. Most of us, you can ask anybody, how many personal offenses do we make? I'll give you an example. You know, today, I don't order the New York, I haven't ordered the New York Times for 35 years. It's all the news that that's, should not be printed. You know, that's, that's what it is. It's like the Daily Mirror, you know? In the old days, the, when a woman washed the floors, she used that to cover the floors, the, the parquet floors after she washed the floors. New York Times, it's as worth as much as the, the editors are worth. That's what it's worth. Person has a newspaper, Wall Street Journal. Come home, you finish eating, you wanna read the Wall Street Journal. You know something? Maybe you should sit and study for half an hour. Study Torah, Torah. If you wouldn't have the paper in your house, maybe you would have you open the book, the Torah book, and study half an hour. But now that you have the Wall Street Journal or other periodicals to read, you're not reading, you're not studying. So what should you do? And it's not going to make a difference whether you succeed in business or you don't succeed in business. A lot of it's purely, purely curiosity. You know something? Don't bring it in the house. You don't bring it in the house. You have the time available and you're not a person that it's just going to whittle away time for nothing. You're going to study. But that's called the fence. How many people make fences for themselves? You have to value certain things to make a fence. It's not worth it. So if it's not worth it and you know that you're vulnerable to certain things, you, you make fences. I gave the example, the food, the periodicals, whatever it may be, or let's say vacation, choosing a vacation spot. Certain vacation spots are not con conducive to spirituality because what you expose yourself to. The certain movies you watch, they're rated. But today, even an ordinary rated movie has things which are inappropriate for an observant Jew, where visually inappropriate, content-wise inappropriate, Language inappropriate. The society pretty much is a lot of inappropriate. It's like fighting a needle in a haystack to find what's appropriate. What it doesn't make a difference. The Rambam writes that if you live in a community where the people are violators, her heretics, even if you have to go into the desert to live, to live in a cave, to escape from that environment, as a Jew, that's your obligation. So if, even though we're not at that level to do that. But to take precautions within the environment to minimize the negative effect is no question, especially knowing and personal praise and understand what God does for us, that forgiveness is not just forgiving, it's with graciousness and with abundance. There's no question if we focus on that and reflect on that, we feel we would do more than we're doing right now. You know, we're spending a little time on, on, on just focusing on what's contained in these, these brachos, it says that the Hasid Mishonim, they would spend an hour before the tefillah, an hour praying. If you would stop and address all we're talking about, you're there for three hours. And even though with three hours, you're not from the Hasid Mishonim, you're not from those original, devoutly righteous people. But there's so much contained here, reality which, has, which pertains to every one of us. And if we would stop and think and reflect and not finish the, the Shimon Esri in a minute, and three seconds, or a minute and a half, or two minutes, you should put no time limit on it. You should provide sufficient time that you shouldn't feel rushed. That whatever time you have, you should be able to reflect as much as you can reflect. And even one time you reflect to this degree on one point, next time you say it, you reflect on another point. It's like I always say, you know, the vidui that we say on Yom Kippur, it's according to the Hebrew alphabet. But you realize, but when you say that video, when you say the confession multiple times, and you say Ashamnu, which means we are guilty, we say everything that has relevance to our lives, which starts with an aleph, we include it, we verbalize that. But sometimes you can't say it all. Every, every time you say video, you can't say it all. Because firstly, it's just too much. You'd be there all day. 
So you divide it, you have to say, you say it so many times, five times. So you divide the various things you want to address, you divide it over those periods of time. Normally, you just have the general idea, and then you focus and you delineate the actual area. The same thing. There's so much to reflect on, to think about, to be touched. You can't, we don't have enough time, but we should have enough time that some of the, what we should reflect on, we should and be touched. Next time we pray, there are other aspects we didn't reflect previously, we should reflect on again, to be touched again by them. You know, right now, just want to mention, you know, what's going on in the Ukraine. Last night, I, I once spent five days in the Ukraine a few years ago, and the one who was being interviewed, his name is Rabbi Meir Stamler. He's originally American, lived in Israel. He's been in the Ukraine for the past close to 40 years. He oversees 139 Jewish communities in the Ukraine. He's recognized by the government, but he, it's called the Federation of Jewish Communities. He's the head of that. He's a very special man. He's, he's responsible for their material welfare, medical, education, everything which pertains to the, Jew of, the life of a Jew, he's responsible. And he was interviewed, asking, asking him what's going on. And he's, he's being interviewed in a bunker. And you could hear in the background, guns being shot, fired, Bombs going off, you get here, this is the real thing. And he tells you, it was asked, are there shortages of food, of the lives of the Jews in danger? If a person would want to go leave, could he leave? Or even when you attempt to leave, you could be killed because the buses are being shot at and the cars are being shot at. What are all these questions? So let me ask in terms of ourselves, I'm not even speaking, giving money to support whatever is needed there food support, other support. What about praying differently today because our brothers in the Ukraine, Jews, Jewish lives in Europe, and we don't even know where this is going. God forbid. This man, he finishes there, he goes from one city to another. Men, women, children, it means nothing. They're killing men, women, and children. It's literally bordering on genocide over there. And God forbid, it could get worse going elsewhere, to other countries. What level of Rachmi Shemayim, of God's mercy do we need over here? And you have to be worthy of mercy. The more worthy we are, our, our prayers, our supplications have different value. So when you say, we want to be brought back to the Torah and to your service. We pray, we don't only pray for ourselves, we pray even for our brother, every Jew in the world, wherever he may be, wherever he's at. He may be a heretic. He may be a this, it doesn't make a difference. Jews are Jews. We all have Jewish souls. We're all part of the same entity. The network called Jewish people. We have to have everybody in mind. We have to upgrade. Now the extra five minutes takes on a new degree of value. And understanding that, appreciating that, hopefully we will invest it in that. And that little bit of investment, which has infinite value, will make the difference to protect our brothers wherever they may be. I'm going to stop here today. Do <laughs> it.